Jubilee Nation, the movie, written by Henry Myers. Over black. Words slowly scroll upward from a black screen, one line at a time, to the tune of music from the Civil War era. The Great War of Succession was over. The South had lost. The Confederates had vowed to fight to the last man, but they could hold out no longer. They had to bear the unbearable. Freed Negroes in the South. What was left in its wake was a new nation. A new black nation. A jubilee nation. Faden. Exterior, airport tarmac. Day. Early 1960s. A billboard ad selling 62 Ford automobiles in background at a distance. Everyone dressed in early 60s attire. Tarmac is crowded with all-black spectators, roped off from an all-black entourage, making their way to an airplane emblazoned with an apparent presidential seal. A gaggle of black reporters and photographers follow a regal-looking black dignitary, nearly 80, dark-skinned, heavy-set, with balding gray hair, surrounded by other black, important-looking VIPs. The entourage head to the plane. The crowd wave and applaud. A white attendant in servant attire follows close behind the dignitary. A white flight attendant deferentially hands out fresh hand towels to each passenger as they board. The dignitary embarks last. He turns and waves to the still cheering crowd. The plane takes off and flies over a large metropolis. Interior, aircraft main cabin, continuous. The reporters, photographers, aides, and staff settle into their seats. In a custom-made section, the dignitary engages in relaxed conversation with several VIPs. The flight attendant serves them drinks. The plane climbs further into the sky. Interior, aircraft cockpit. A black pilot and co-pilot monitor the flight controls, casually engaging in conversation. All appears normal. Exterior, airport tarmac. The spectators watch the aircraft climb into the clouds. They continue to wave and cheer at the plane. Interior, aircraft main cabin. Everyone on board comfortably read, write, or are engaged in normal passenger forms of activity. Interior, aircraft cockpit. The pilots continue their flight duties. The flight attendant enters the cockpit and offers some coffee. The flight remains routine. Exterior, airport tarmac. The plane flies further into the distance. Suddenly, Smoke begins to slowly billow from an engine seen from a distance. Full-throttled applause starts to die down as the crowd chatters and disperse. Without warning, there is a loud explosion. Everyone looks up into the sky. Someone screams in horror. The plane exploded. The crowd screams. Frozen expression of shock and horror come across their face. Plumes of smoke billows into the sky. The aircraft in flames spirals down to the ground. Sound of sirens and flashing lights grow louder and brighter. Emergency personnel scramble to vehicles headed towards the crash. Dissolve to black screen. The din of cars, buses, and other sounds of a city coming to life are heard slowly rising to reveal. Superimpose, Atlanta, 1962. Exterior, city streets, Daybreak. A hazy red sun is rising. A neon sign blinks Lucky Strike Cigarettes on and off through the glazed glass window of a storefront. Superimpose. Six months later. A series of shots of street signs seen to a backdrop of various locations. Peachtree Street, Garvey Underground, Flatiron Park, Frederick Douglass Stadium, Harriet Tubman Raceway. At each location, affluently attired African Americans are seen walking dogs, jogging, getting into cars, etc. On a main thoroughfare, buses and traffic begin to move about the city streets. The hum of car engines slowly grow louder. 
more and more people of African-American heritage begin to appear on the streets, bustling about. They're uniformly well-dressed, with an intellectual air, reading, feverishly writing on notepads, engaged in spirited conversation, etc. Out of focus, white people dressed mainly as laborers pleasantly engage in assorted menial activities, mowing lawns, sweeping streets, loading trucks, etc. Long shot of antebellum-style building, a red, green, and black flag flies above it. It appears to be the capital of a government. Exterior, high-rise apartment building, continuous. A high-rise apartment building in an affluent city neighborhood comes into focus, and steadily the camera pans its length. The huge sign reads, The St. Belmont. The camera moves up to the top floor patio of a penthouse balcony with high sliding glass windows that extend its length. It is immaculately furnished with expensive 60s style patio furniture. A white faced jockey statue stands in a corner. Interior, penthouse, living slash dining room. The camera slowly reveals an elegantly decorated great room. African art generously adorn the walls, some depicting slave and antebellum period themes. Bacon sizzles in the background. The muted sound of a television broadcasting the morning news is heard in the empty great room, dimly lit by early morning sunlight. The voice of a newscaster comes into focus. Good morning, Atlanta. Looks like another hot day this Monday, August 10th, in the capital. Hope everyone had a great weekend. Now to the news. Interior, penthouse kitchen, continuous. A pair of white hands move about preparing breakfast on a stove in the luxuriously appointed kitchen. A metal coffee maker percolates. A tiny radio quietly plays 60s big band music. Muted voice from a television is heard in the background. A news broadcast comes to scene. Television newscast. To other news, preparations continue around the city and nation for the 100th anniversary celebrations of the founding of our beloved UAASA, the United African American States of America. Sarah Simmons has a special report. Filmed footage. Footage of historical founding of the nation and backstory. Ends with footage of the upcoming presidential election and tragic death of the previous president. Yes, our mourning is still great for our beloved President Garvey. Senator Thurgood Powell III is expected to defeat Senator Ulysses Bedford Kane in a landslide in November. Thank you, Sarah. And now to Tecumseh Early with the weather. Back to scene. Interior, penthouse bedroom. Luxurious, elegantly laid out, and oddly oversized. There is a series of shots of its accruments. Handcrafted curtains drape the expansive windows. A mahogany Italian dresser. A large-framed black-and-white photograph of an attractive black woman modeling above it. A tiled shower of fine granite and bronze fixtures. An expensive Rolex watch sits on a nightstand. A paisley silk robe, monogrammed with the initials SJS, is draped over an outsized, stuffed chaise sofa near the bed. A radio alarm clock goes off playing early 60s jazz. Laying alone, sprawled across a king-size bed, is Symington J. Smith, 37, handsome. African-American of Caribbean descent, his looks reminiscent of a young Harry Belafonte. A wall is covered with accolades bearing his name. A journalism degree from Timbuktu University, a graduation picture with his richly attired parents. A photograph of him in combat fatigues in a Southeast Asia jungle with notebook in hand, posing with a similarly dressed photographer, a framed award for writing from New Negro Digest magazine. He sits up in the bed and stretches. He walks over to the curtains. We see the silhouette of his naked athletic body in them to let sunlight in. Exterior, a park. Continuous, day, dawn. Dressed in jogging clothes, Symington runs through a park. He jogs past an idyllic series of visuals of the city that surround him. Trees, water fountains, park buildings, tennis courts, etc. 
he passes an imposing bronze statue of a stately black man with a plaque inscribed, Ambrose Pickett Smith, 1838 to 1879. Interior, Symington's bedroom. Throwing off his jogging clothes, he sits on his bed and taps a cigarette out of a pack of Lucky Strike, putting it in a cigarette holder. Sweating, he pops a couple of Benzedrine in his mouth, washing them down with leftover wine in a glass. He walks naked into the bathroom. He pees. He turns on the shower and walks in, closing the glass shower door behind him. Interior, Symington in the shower. Symington soaps and washes himself. The camera pans his body from torso to foot and back again. A blissful look on his face suddenly turns into an unrecognizable glare. The water streaming down drowns out any sound. He turns his back to the glass shower door. His hands begin to move back and forth. The sound of water starts to mix slowly with the increasingly intense sound of moaning. Water bombards his face, cascading down his cheeks, his eyes closed. His breathing grows louder, faster, and heavier. Suddenly, his body shudders. His sweaty and intense expression becomes calm. His eyes slowly open as he takes a deep breath. Out of the shower, he gazes into the bathroom mirror, inspecting himself. He meticulously combs his naturally wavy black hair. Back in his bedroom, he dresses. Donning the Rolex, an inscription is seen. From father on your 18th birthday, Jackson Edgeford Smith. Symington takes one last look in the mirror. His clothes are snazzy and urban. He wears a stylish, Kent-designed red, black, and green cardigan sweater over a black turtleneck gray straight leg sharkskin trousers, and black alligator shoes. He exudes avant-garde 60s personified. He walks with an almost unnoticeable limp down a hallway to the living room and takes a seat at a huge contemporary dining room table. Interior, Symington's living dining room. Resting under the table is his pet English terrier, Jack. He sips a glass of orange juice and affectionately rubs Jack's head. Farnsworth, my black coffee, please. The hands seen earlier suddenly pick up the pace. They pour a cup of coffee and grab a newspaper. The figure of the man is seen from neck down, dressed in servant attire. He scurries over and lays out the paper and coffee. Thank you, Farnsworth. The man's face is revealed. Jameson Farnsworth Booth. Early 40s. White, manservant to Symington, somewhat short and stocky, wears a shadow, scruffy beard. He is slightly sloppy in his dress, not out of indifference, but a subtle undertone of unassuming defiance. He walks to the curtains and draws them open to let in the early morning sunlight. Good morning, sir. Will there be anything else? I just picked up fresh grapefruit from the market. No, that will be all, Farnsworth. Gotta rush off. Big day at the office. Here, Jack. He tosses several slices of bacon from his plate to Jack, catching it in his mouth, wagging his tail with great pleasure. Symington opens a briefcase and pulls out a document. As he continues to attend to Symington, Farnsworth curiously observes his delighted face. I hope I'm not being out of place here, sir, but there's something about you this morning bringing you great joy. Symington waves the document Farnsworth's direction. What I'm holding here, Farnsworth? is my future. Exuberant pride. Your future, sir? It's my best writing since my war correspondent days. It's the final draft of my article for the Jubilee. I'm never one to pry, sir, but you surely had me scratching my head on that one. You've been locking yourself in that darn office for weeks. You had me getting mighty worried about you lately. Symington gathers his papers, gingerly packing them into his briefcase. I've been waiting a long time for this, Farnsworth. My crown jewel. My heart and soul is in this one. Finally, I'm going to get the recognition I deserve at emancipation. I declare, Mr. Smith, you always pushing yourself so hard at that old high and mighty magazine. He clears the table, looking around at his surroundings, shaking his head in awe. It just don't make sense to me. 
You got everything a man could want and then some. A lot of people will give their right arm to be sitting where you at. Symington gathers his remaining belongings as he prepares to leave. <sighs> That's the problem. I've got everything I could possibly want. But there's one thing that's eluded me all my life. Respect. Farnsworth continues to clear the table and other tasks to straighten the room. Now I'm real confused, sir. How can I be? Respect? Not every day somebody descended from the founding fathers of a nation. Ain't no place in this whole country you can go without seeing the name Smith. Smith here, Smith there. On schools, buildings, airports. Everywhere, that stuff means nothing to me. Living my life off my name? Family trust fund? I want to be known for me, not my family. I see it really anguishes you, sir. I know it's not my place, but why don't you just quit that old magazine? You ain't got nothing to prove to nobody. They got you running in circles like a dog chasing his tail. It just ain't right. Somewhat dejected, Symington continues to slowly finish filling his briefcase. I'm not a fool, Farnsworth. I know they only use me for my name. And when I'm of no use, they'll find a way to get rid of me, just like the others. They always do. But it's not about them, it's about me. I have to make it work this time, whatever it takes. He gathers his last belongings and heads to the door. He pauses at a mirror in the hallway for a last look at himself. Pleased, he smiles radiantly. I feel like a million bucks this morning, Farnsworth. I want to celebrate tonight. I think Veronica and I will have dinner on the terrace. Pick up a bottle of that wine I love, that, um... Barlow Giovanni Pipione 51. Barlow Pipion. Ah, yes, that's it. Get us a bottle, would you? Matter of fact, make it too. She'll love it. Farnsworth helps Symington on with his jacket and brushes off his shoulders. Best of luck today, sir. Thank you, Farnsworth. Interior, Symington's 58 Aston Martin. Day, traveling. Symington taps his fingers on the steering wheel to big band music on the radio. He approaches an exit sign that reads Sherman's Point. As he gets closer, he has a quick memory flash. Flash cut to interior, a dark club lounge. Night, flashing red and black lights, music playing. Scantily clad white women dressed in black studded leather outfits mingle with assorted types of African-American men, all wearing black masks over their eyes as they drink, laugh, and fondle women. And memory flash. Interior, Symington's 58, Aston Martin, continuous. Symington sweats and his face is flushed. He grabs a handkerchief from his pocket and wipes his brow. Exterior, Atlanta City Street. Day, continuous. Farnsworth shops on a busy downtown street. It is peppered with various markets, restaurants, and retail stores. White workers in shops all cheerfully perform various menial tasks. Sweeping floors, ringing cash registers, cutting hair, etc. He runs into a group of white shoppers with bags, dressed in butler or servant-type attire. They engage in small talk. The grapefruit I got this morning was so fresh. My boss's children insist on fresh every day. Won't eat nothing else. Hey, Farnsworth, how are things with you and Mr. Smith? Everything good. Good? What you talking about good? I don't know about y'all, but I got this feeling. This country hasn't had a new president in 30 years. I do wonder if it'll be good for us or not. There ain't no need worrying about things you can't see. We know who our creator is, and he gonna make everything all right. Barnesworth waves farewell and walks down a street alone. He pulls a pamphlet from his pocket. It is for the campaign of Senator Thurgood Powell III. He stops and looks at it with a smug look on his face. Interior, Barnesworth's bedroom. Continuous. A dim Spartan room with no windows. A small bed, dresser, table, and small television. The walls are covered with framed pictures of assorted species of butterflies. Farnsworth sits at the table, illuminated by a lamp. The television plays in the background. He reaches in a drawer and pulls out an envelope. It is addressed from Claire Jenkins Booth, Southern White Enclave, Number 2, South Georgia, 
24653. He reads, Insert the letter. My dear boy Farney, I hopes you're doing well. Your sister's getting along good right about now. I knows under the circumstances you can't come home, but we all longing to see you, praying every day for you to come back to us. Priscilla about back to her normal self. She sleeps most nights now. Her nightmares about what happened not as bad like it was before. My dearest boy, we thank the almighty God for you and the sacrifices you done made for us. Take care and God bless. Signed Mom with the imprint of a kiss. Back to scene. Teary-eyed. He opens up a desk drawer and retrieves a checkbook. He writes, Claire Booth, $1,000. He seals the check in an envelope and puts a stamp on it. He props his feet on the desk and lights a cigarette and stares at the ceiling. Exterior, city streets, day. Symington pulls up to a high-rise building on a busy downtown street. A valet comes to the car and takes his keys. He gets out and walks through the huge glass revolving doors at the entrance. Interior, office building lobby, day. A busy, cavernous, modern 1960s lobby filled with African-American workers, mainly in professional attire. Symington enters an elevator and pushes the button to the 11th floor. He exits the elevator and walks to a door emblazoned Emancipation Magazine, Douglas C. Bennington, Editor. Two attractive young women walk past as he prepares to enter. He straightens himself, smiles, and gentlemanly slightly bows to them. Um, what sights to behold? I never get enough of things of beauty. Interior, Emancipation Magazine offices. Framed posters of past magazine covers cover the walls. A continuous hum of pecking typewriters and din of random conversations are heard in spurts and starts. Symington moves through the reception area past Jenny, a cheerful young receptionist. There is a small staff of writers and other personnel mill around desks, drinking coffee, filling papers, etc. All are of African-American descent. Good morning, Mr. Smith. Good morning, Jenny. Big meeting with Bennington today. Feeling good, like I hit the trifecta at the track. He passionately pats his briefcase, holding his proposal, treating it like it's gold. Looks like it's going to be your day, Mr. Smith. Good luck. Smiling, he gently gives her a friendly pinch on her cheek. You're a doll, Jenny. Thanks. He passes the office of Grant Rivers, 30s, African-American, unabashedly ambitious and gay, dressed flamboyantly, and wearing fashionable, round-framed spectacles. Good morning, Symington. How's it hanging? Symington has an irked look on his face. It's hanging just fine, Grant. Jesus, you'll never know. Symington walks into his office and sits at his desk. He opens his briefcase and goes over his proposal. A tap on the door. It's open. Come in. The door slowly opens, and Wells P. Noble, late 60s, gray-haired, distinguished enters. He has the look of a man whose time has come and gone. Well-dressed, he smokes a pipe. Am I disturbing you? Symington, paying slight attention, continues to read his proposal. Hi, Wells. Nah, I'm fine. Come on in. He waves him in. He takes a seat. Me and the boys are going for cocktails later. Uh, Care to join us? Symington listens, but continues to shuffle his papers around. Sounds great, but not tonight. I have plans for dinner with Veronica. What's the occasion? Despondent, Wells gets up and walks slowly to a window and stares blankly through the blinds. He takes a puff of his pipe. I guess you haven't heard. Emancipation's letting me go. Letting you go? That's not possible. Is it? He said it's a new day in the nation and times are changing. I guess I don't fit in with the times. He turns and looks out the door and peers at a giddy Grant sitting at a desk nearby on the phone. That's what they want today. Guys like him. Wells points at Grant and indignantly throws his head back. You know, Symington, I gave this magazine everything I had. I didn't even see it coming. You can't let this happen to you, Wells. This magazine is what it is today because of you. 
Rook, I'm meeting with Bennington this morning. Give me a chance to change his mind. Well, stands in front of Symington and grasps him by his shoulders. Forget it, kid. When your time is up, it's up. He wearily looks down at the papers on Symington's desk. He taps them with his fingers. A little advice, Symington. Look out for yourself. This can be a cold, heartless business. Nobody cares. No matter what you do. You eat yourself alive trying to prove yourself. Just to find out in the end it wasn't even worth it. There was a light tap on the door. Jenny sticks her head into Symington's office. Mr. Bennington is ready to see you, Mr. Smith. Wells stares out a window numbly into space. Symington walks up behind him. Wells? Wells, you okay? Wells weakly nods he is okay. I gotta go. He takes a deep breath, gathers his papers, and heads to Bennington's office. Passing Jenny, he pauses to compose himself and enters. Interior, Bennington's office. The office is spacious and finely appointed. A sofa, bar, huge conference table, and a large television on a corner table fill the room. A morning news show plays on the TV without volume. Douglas C. Bennington, late 50s, receding gray afro, mustache, sideburns smattered with gray, smokes a cigar. He looks as if he was once an athlete who finally said, to hell with it. His movements are animated in nature. He sits behind an imposing mahogany desk, scattered with papers, photographs, and other items typically seen on an editor's desk. Symington confidently takes a seat in a large leather chair in front of Bennington's desk. He pulls a proposal from his briefcase. Good morning, boss. I've got the final draft of my proposal for the Jubilee article right here. Ready for my presentation? Bennington moves quickly from behind his desk and stands in front of the seated Symington. He grabs Symington's hands to stop him from proceeding. Symington, no need for me to jump around in the bushes. Forcefully, he pats Symington on the shoulder. I've decided I'm scrapping your story for the Jubilee. The confident look on Symington's face only seconds ago changes from excitement to dismay. What? I've been going over the drafts you already submitted, and frankly, Symington, your take on the Jubilee it just ain't cutting it. Bennington reaches for a cigar and lighter from a box on his desk. He turns and lights it directly in front of Symington. It's a puff piece, son. That's not emancipation. We don't do puff pieces. Bennington blows smoke in Symington's direction, filling the room. He moves from in front of Symington, shaking his head as he sits back behind his desk. My God, Symington, it's the Jubilee. If anybody should know what that means, it should be you. This story needs more verve, sparkle, pizzazz but still filled with lots of emotion to evoke the spirit of the occasion for the nation. I'm talking real writing, son. The office door opens, and Grant walks in. Oh, sorry, boss. Didn't know you were in a meeting. With a broad smile, he waves him in. Oh, Grant, come on in. Come on in, my boy. Symington stares at Grant. It is obvious he is not amused by his appearance, and senses something is up. Symington, Grant pitched me a great angle for the Jubilee story. He pats Grant on the shoulders, while he smugly grins like a Chelsea cat. I'm giving him a shot at it. Stunned, Symington jumps up from his chair. What? You can't do that, Mr. Bennington. It's my story. I have to have this story. He slams his proposal furiously back into his briefcase. You can't do this to me. Sorry, Symington. No doubt in my mind, Grant is the right man for the job. Symington's body trembles and seems to shift in all directions at once. Baffled what to do next, he takes a moment to gather himself. Finally, he breaks his silence. Excuse me, I have to go to the bathroom. He rises from his chair and dashes out of the office, slamming the door behind him. Bennington and Grant look on. They return to their conversation, unfazed by his tirade. Interior, men's bathroom, office. Continuous. Symington storms into a toilet cubicle. He slams the stall door shut and locks it. He flails around the stall, punching the walls in anger. Beads of sweat drip down his face. He leans against the stall door and covers his face with his hands. His hands move down from his face, and we hear him unzip his pants and raise the toilet seat. His face gyrates back and forth between rage and pleasure. 
Beads of sweat stream from his forehead down his contorted face. Moments later, there's a loud groan and his face becomes serene. He storms from the cubicle and rushes through the office past Jenny's desk. Interior, Emancipation Magazine, main office area. Is everything okay, Mr. Smith? Uh, yeah, Jenny. Would you tell Mr. Douglas I had to take care of an emergency at home? He dashes out of the office into the hallway. He opens his briefcase and throws his copy of the article into a nearby trash can. He climbs onto an elevator. He rushes through the lobby and steps out onto the street. Moments later, a valet brings his car. He gets in. Interior, Symington's 58 Aston Martin. Continuous. He sits in his car for a moment, not moving. He bows his head over the steering wheel. Cars honk their horns for him to move. He gathers himself, puts the car in gear, and drives off. Exterior, city streets, continuous. Symington races down streets onto a highway. He passes an exit sign that reads, Sherman's Point. Interior, Symington's car. He glances back at the sign in his rearview mirror as he whizzes by. He sweats profusely, deep in contemplation. He sees a truck stop plaza exit sign ahead and turns off onto it. Exterior, truck plaza. He parks in the plaza and shuts the car off. Interior, Symington's car. He sits a moment and stares into space. He starts the car and gets back onto the highway in the direction of Sherman's Point exit. He sees it and takes it. Dissolve to. Interior, Symington's penthouse living room. Day. Dusk. A glint of sunlight still illuminates the nearly dark room. Faint sound of jazz music plays in the background. Wide shot of the room comes into focus on a fully dressed, motionless figure laying face down on the large, plush sofa. A key rattles in the door. The door opens, and the white hand of a man searches for a light switch on a wall by the door and cuts it on. It illuminates a figure of the man lying on the sofa. He quickly rushes to his aid. My lord, Mr. Smith. He helps Symington into a sitting position. Are you all right, sir? Symington is still dressed from work, but his clothes are in disarray. Still groggy, his impaired speech is barely intelligible. I didn't make it home, Farnsworth. I can see, sir. Let me help you. Farnsworth looks at the clock on the living room wall. It's 6 p.m. We gotta get you cleaned up. Miss Veronica gonna be here at 8. He helps Symington off the sofa. Thank you, Farnsworth. If I didn't have you to take care of me... I don't know what I'd do. I know, sir, I know. Farnsworth, I did give you what I promised the other day, didn't I? Oh, yes, you did indeed, sir, and it was very generous of you. Nowhere near what you deserve, Farnsworth. Nowhere near. That's kind of you to say, sir. Let's get you out of these clothes and ready for the evening. He pulls Symington up and heads to the bedroom. Interior? Symington's bedroom shower. Farnsworth undresses him and helps him into the shower. He turns the water on, snapping Symington out of his groggy state. Damn it, Farnsworth. What the hell are you doing to me? That water is fucking freezing. Don't worry, sir. You'll be okay. He leaves him in the shower and returns to the kitchen. Symington calms down. He closes his eyes and lets the water run down his face onto his body. Interior, penthouse kitchen, living room. Farnsworth finishes preparing dinner. The living area is set with soft jazz music and subtle lighting. The terrace can be seen through the sliding glass doors with the view of the city at night. A dinner table is set with fine china, wine glasses, and candles. Symington emerges from a hallway dressed in a monogrammed paisley robe. Still somewhat groggy, he stands near Farnsworth. I want to thank you for earlier. That's what I'm here for, sir. Better finish getting dressed. Miss Veronica will be here soon. Dissolve to. Exterior, Symington's penthouse terrace. Night. Later. Symington is alone on the terrace, looking out at the city. 
The mood is quiet and serene. On the candlelit table sits half-empty wine glasses, some roses, and plates with remnants of food from dinner. Jazz music plays in the background. A pair of woman's arms wrap around his waist. The woman is Veronica Dupriest, early 30s, tall, beautiful, light complexion. She is the fashion model seen in the photograph in Symington's bedroom. Hey, baby. Dinner was fantastic. I'm glad. I wanted so much for you to enjoy it. He continues to look out over the city with a far-off, distant look on his face. What's wrong, baby? Still bothered by what happened today? I was so close this time. I don't know, baby. Maybe I should just quit writing. Maybe I don't have what it takes anymore. Don't say that, Simington. To me, you're the best. I've never met anyone more talented than you. Why do you always doubt yourself? You're right. As long as I have you, it doesn't matter anyway. You're my goddess, Veronica. I don't ever want to lose you. Promise, you'll never leave me. You know my feelings for you, but I just don't know. She continues to dress, picking up her pace. It's been a year we've been together, but I still feel like, well, I still don't know you, Symington. I know. I know it sounds crazy, but all my life, I've dreamed of this perfect man. I know he doesn't exist, but I'm always trying to find him. I want him to be you, Symington, but I just don't know. Why do you say that, baby? What is it holding you back from me? Tell me, I'll fix it. Look, let's have fun tonight. We don't need to spoil this great meal, this great wine. I love you, Symington. Come on, let's get nice and cozy. She takes him by the hand and leads him to the bedroom. We see the candle on the dinner table burn out and hear soft jazz music. Dissolve to Interior, Symington's penthouse, bedroom, later. Symington and Veronica lay in bed. They have just finished making love. Jazz music still plays in the background. He smokes a cigarette while she lays staring at the ceiling. She gets out of bed and starts to dress. What are you doing? She continues to dress. I have to go. I have a shoot early in the morning. Symington sits up in the bed, stunned she is leaving. He gently holds her arm for her to stop. Don't go. Can't you leave early in the morning? Don't go yet. She looks at him up and down with a look of unfulfillment. No, I I think I better go. What's wrong? I don't understand you. The only way you fuck me like a man is when you want me to hold you down or spank you or, or other sick stuff like that. I don't know what the hell is wrong with you, Symington. Is that it? You leaving me because of those little things? That's not what I want, Symington. I want normal kind of relationship. This thing with you in the bedroom, it's not normal. She preens and waves her hand over her body. Look at me. I can have any man I want. I don't need this. I know, but I need you. If I lost you, I don't know what I would do. She rummages through her purse, searching for her car keys. A slip of paper falls out. On it is the name Jedediah and a phone number. Symington picks it up. Jedediah? Jedediah Jackson? The model? Yeah. We had lunch. There's a shoot in Milan this fall and we're talking about working together. Symington has a solemn look on his face. That damn weasel. So that's it? You got a thing for Jedediah? That's our problem? How dare you? You see a number and right away I'm fucking somebody? You know what? I should be. But I love you. But you gotta get it together, Symington, or you will lose me. What do I have to do to keep you, Veronica? Just tell me. I'll do anything. Figure it out. What the hell is wrong with you, Symington? I think we need some time apart. I told you what I want. Fix it. She finishes gathering her belongings and takes one last look at him. She shakes her head and leaves the room. We hear the door slam shut. Symington lies in bed. He lights a cigarette and sips wine from a glass on a bedside table. He looks at his watch. He stares out into space. He looks at his watch again. Restless, he suddenly jumps up and starts to get dressed. 
Interior, living dining room. Fully dressed, he enters the living room. He grabs his car keys from a table and walks out of the door. Interior, Farnsworth's bedroom. Continuous. The noise awakens Farnsworth. He looks at a clock on a table. It is 2 a.m. He shakes his head, unconcerned, and goes back to sleep. Exterior, highway, night, traveling. Lights flicker from cars traveling on the dark highway. Sounds of vehicles whizzing by are heard. Interior, Symington's 58 Aston Martin. POV of Symington driving. His eyes peer left and right, looking for Sherman's Point exit sign. He passes several exits. Harriet Tubman Raceway, Flatiron Park, Peachtree Street. He comes upon the Sherman's Point exit and turns off. Exterior, city streets, Sherman's Point, traveling. The streets are quiet at first. Business is closed, streets deserted, as he drives on. A welcome sign reads, Welcome to Sherman's Point. Slowly, he starts to see more activity. Red lights and illuminated businesses come into sight. He enters a section of the city full of bars and nightclubs. He looks around for a place to park. He finds a spot and parks. Exterior, city streets, Sherman's Point. He walks several blocks, peering at different seedy establishments with names like The Beehive, Private Lotus, and Eruptions, offering various forms of adult entertainment. The doormen are all white. The patrons entering the establishments are all African American. He sees a club with a flashing neon marquee that reads The Velvet Beaver Lounge, offering strip shows. He walks up to the entrance, the doorman looks him over, and opens the door. He points to a cover girl just inside, and Symington enters. Interior, Velvet Beaver, main bar. He walks down a dark hall with black walls spattered with obscene graffiti, lit by dim red lights. He enters a large plush lounge where scantily clad, mostly attractive black and white strippers walk the floor dance on stages, or give men lap dances. Entranced, he grabs a seat at the bar. A bartender comes over and he orders a drink. He watches the strippers perform their routines on stages while men throw money at their feet. Sometime later, Symington watches the dancers in a trance-like state, on the floor, on the stage, as they walk past him. He sweats profusely and continues to drink. A white waitress nudges him and asks him if he wants another drink. He nods yes. Several of the strippers walking the floor come over and dance lewdly around him. Nursing his drink, and far too drunk to care, he rebuffs their sexual advances. A white stripper whispers in his ear and massages his crotch. He leers over her body and agrees to follow her. Interior, Velvet Beaver, private VIP room. She takes him by the hand to a private VIP room. Symington hands her money. She starts to dance for him. Initially excited, he suddenly becomes distressed. He bolts from the room back to the bar. Interior, Velvet Beaver, main bar. A man sitting at the other end of the bar notices Symington's distressed state. He watches him for a moment, then grabs his drink and takes a seat beside him. His name is Mishmash Jones, African-American, early 40s, a flashy dressing slicker type, familiar with everyone in the club. You okay, buddy? You don't look so good. Not having fun? The stripper Symington was with passes by and shakes her head. Mishmash smiles at her. I've had luscious a couple of times. Never came back looking like you. Huh? Who are you? My name's Mishmash. Mish Mash Jones. I'm sort of an unofficial ambassador for this little fucker den. Who the fuck are you? He takes a closer look. Wait a minute. <laughs> I be damned. I know you. You're part of that um, Smith family, right? It's not something I normally broadcast, so why don't you pretend you didn't ask? I'm good with that. Looks like you in the wrong kind of place, though. What you doing here? 
Places with caviar and champagne more your taste, ain't it? I know places like that. But then I know places like this. I need places like this. I need a certain kind of place for the various physical pursuits I enjoy. Symington surveys the action around him. He looks dissatisfied with his surroundings. This ain't it. I think it's time to go. Take it easy, pal. Be seeing you. Symington leaves money on the bar for the bartender. He gets up to leave. Mishmash gently grabs his arm. You know, before you go, I know where you can have some real fun. Here. Mishmash pulls a card from his pocket and puts it on the bar. On the card, written in big letters, is the word no. Symington looks at the car and turns it over. On the back, it reads, Club No, with a phone number. He puts the card back on the bar. Mishmash picks up the car and stuffs it in Symington's pocket. Sure a guy like you don't want to be seen in places like this, huh? I think you might find this a little bit more to your liking. Trust me, you won't be sorry. Symington takes the card from his pocket and inspects it again. Where's the address? Don't ask questions. Just call the number. You'll find out the rest. Symington pays for his drinks and leaves. Interior. Emancipation magazine office. Day. Typical magazine office morning activity. Cut to shots of black writers at desks typing or conversing with staff personnel, etc. Symington is gloomy and still hungover from the night before. He stares out a window deep in thought. He hears an uptick of activity outside his door. Several colleagues rush past his door in the direction of Bennington's office. Jenny sticks her head in his door. Mr. Bennington wants all the writers in his office. Now. What the hell is going on, Jenny? I don't know, but it must be something real important. Symington lifts himself up slowly from his chair... He gathers himself and trudges out the door. He runs into an unkempt and unshaven Wells in the hallway. They walk together. You know what's going on, Wells? No idea. They walk past Jenny's desk and enter Bennington's office. Bennington sits at his desk with his feet up, watching the television in the corner of the room. On the barely audible TV is Senator Powell, being interviewed by a reporter. With a wide grin, Bennington lights a cigar. Assembled are his main writers. Wells, Symington, Grant, Ethan, late thirties and nerdy sort. Jacob, early forties, sophisticated, well-dressed. And Seamus, late thirties, overweight, balding, and bespectacled. They take seats around the conference table and wait nervously for Bennington to speak. I got great news, boys. He moves from behind his desk and walks around the room. He points to the television. See who's on the TV? Senator Powell is still being interviewed by a reporter. Probably the next president of the USAAS, and guess what? They all perk up. His campaign called last night. They said they want the public to see more of the senator's soft aside. They've offered emancipation and exclusive to do a profile on him. They all look at each other. Bennington continues to circle around the room behind each chair. The smoke from a cigar fills the room. I've got Grant on the Jubilee story, so Ethan, I'm putting you on the piece. You got it, boss. Oh, oh. What is it, Ethan? Can't do it, boss. You forgot you put me on the environmental expose piece? It's got to be out for the election issue, or we'll lose our advertising account with Mansion Coffee. Bennington scratches his head, somewhat taken aback he had forgotten. Um, oh yeah, okay. You're out on this one. Seamus, I'm assigning you to the story. Bennington looks more concerned. Small beads of sweat form on his forehead, but he's sure he got it right this time. Symington, still smarting from the loss of the Jubilee story, looks on uninvolved. Got it, boss. Uh Uh-oh. Bennington stops pacing in his tracks. What is it now? Mm, Hmm, Jessica and I are going to the States for our 10th anniversary next month. I'm going to get killed if I have to cancel. Can you please give it to someone else? Bennington looks clearly irritated. Damn it. Okay. Jacob, whatever you're working on, drop it. I want you on this first thing in the morning. No excuses. 
are you sure about that, boss? Uh, what am I supposed to do about the office party? Everyone is depending on me. Oh, yeah. That's right. The last thing I need, a revolt in the office. He turns his attention to Symington and Wells. He looks at Wells, unkempt, unshaven. He looks like a man defeated and on his way out. Bennington shakes his head. Reluctantly, he turns to Symington, realizing he has no choice but to... Symington, my boy. About that little tiff yesterday, just a little, um... Let's say professional disagreement. Bennington goes to his desk and puts out his cigar. He picks up a portfolio on Senator Powell and holds it in his hand as he speaks. Well, what do you know? A chance at a reprieve for us both. I get a chance to soothe your feelings a bit, and you get a chance to prove me wrong about that Jubilee story. Symington gives him an icy stare. A moment passes. <clears throat> so what do you say, Symington? Bygones be bygones, right? Symington gets up from his chair and takes command. He's in charge now. Funny. Yesterday my writing was a piece of shit. Today I'm your golden boy. Assign me to the story or lose an exclusive. How ironic. Bennington listens sheepishly, but in an instant returns to his usual confrontational self. He lights a cigar again and gets up from his chair. I know you're a little sore, but I'll be honest with you. He blows smoke in Symington's face and wraps his arms around his shoulders. I think you're going to fuck this up, too. I know the owners want you here, but personally, I don't give a shit, even if your name is Smith. He unwraps his arm from around Symington and sits back in his chair. You were a pretty good writer at one time at the Digest. What happened to you? I see what you're doing here at Emancipation. You think you're going to make a name for yourself here by writing for the biggest magazine in the nation. Bennington puts out his cigar and picks up the portfolio. It would be a pleasure to see the shit-eating look on your face when you're finished, and I get to say, it's no good. Again. A moment passes. Symington leans in over Bennington's desk and looks him straight in the eyes. You know what? I'm going to take that challenge. Regardless of what you think of me, I know the Jubilee piece was the best work I've done here. But maybe I was wrong. You want a great story for the magazine? I'm going to give it to you. And when I do, you're going to regret giving my story to Grant to fuck it up. A smug grin slowly grows on Bennington's face. I like the spunk, kid. Much better than yesterday. Just remember, no special privileges here. Bennington, finally relieved to have someone on the story, hands the portfolio to Symington. Here's some background material to get you started. He's holding a fundraiser tomorrow night at the St. Charles Hotel. He's expecting us to be there. Symington takes the folder and surveys its contents. He tries to fight back his excitement, but breaks out in a slight smile. A good start. I look real good in a tuxedo. Okay, now all of you, get the hell out of my office and get back to work. Everyone files out of Bennington's office. Wells and Symington leave together and walk down the corridor. I'm sorry you didn't get a shot at this, Wells. The dejected look on Wells' face is palpable. Hey, don't worry about it. It's the game. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. Sometimes you're out. Do a great job, kid. You never know when it's your last chance at bat. Wells and Symington look back at Bennington's office. He stands in the door, cigar in mouth, staring back at them, shaking his head. Interior, exterior, the St. Charles Hotel, night. Shot of a grand exterior of hotel, a majestic Georgian structure with a large outside portobello patio illuminated by spotlights of different colors. Parking valets enter and exit cars arriving and departing. Interior pan of the handsomely appointed lobby, populated by white doormen, bellhops, etc., and mostly African-American guests. Interior, the St. Charles Hotel Ballroom. Black tie fundraiser, room full of beautiful and affluent black guests dressed in formal wear, sit around enormous round tables while being served dinner by staff of white servants. There's a days where several dignitaries sit, including Senator Powell. A speaker introduces the senator. And senator, while the unfortunate circumstances that have brought us here remain fresh in our minds, we have faith in you and believe that most of the nation is behind you. Loud applause. Guests at each table rise and cheer his name. Powell. 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 
The senator looks out from his seat with a confident smile. It is my honor and my privilege to introduce Senator and next president of our beloved United African American States of America, Thurgood J. Powell III. The senator heads to the day slowly, milking the crowd to continue their applause. Thank you. Thank you. He takes a handkerchief from his pocket and wipes his brow and lips. The crowd continues to chant, Powell, Powell, Powell. Thank you. Thank you very much. They keep applauding longer than necessary. The senator, all smiles, reluctantly gestures for them to sit. Please, please take your seats. Thank you. Thank you. The applause dies down and the crowd takes their seat. Powell begins his remarks. Interior, the St. Charles Hotel Ballroom. Symington walks into the ballroom elegantly dressed in a black tuxedo. He casually strolls up to a bar while watching the senator speak. He takes a cigarette from a gold case he pulls from his jacket and lights it. A white bartender, 50s, dressed formally, comes over to attend him. May I help you, sir? Scotch and soda. Make it a double. Senator speaking. Symington watches his animated speech out of focus from the bar. Applause rises and falls from the crowd as he speaks. He vigorously flails his arm along with the sound of his muted voice. He wraps up a speech with a thunderous... Thank you. Thank you. Let's go win this thing in November. Thank you. The guests all stand and break into roaring, continuous applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The exuberant chorus of chants resumes. Powell. 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 The senator waves as he exits the dais. A cadre of aides follow him, along with a security detail of formidable-looking white men wearing dark glasses. Photographers pop snapshots, while reporters jostle for the senator's attention. Symington is still at the bar watching the senator exit. The bartender comes over with a bottle of scotch and starts to pour him another drink. Scotch and soda? Yeah. The bartender wipes the bar, nodding his head approvingly. I tell you, sir, uh, Senator Powell should knows how to give a good speech. Symington is surprised by his enthusiasm. You like Powell? I got a good old feeling he's going to do some real good for the white race this time. Uh, um, I mean, the black race. Symington is taken aback by his remarks. Huh? I'm sorry, sir. Is there anything else I can get for you? Symington stares at him with a look of bewilderment. He shakes it off as if nothing was said. Uh, Senator Powell, just another empty suit to me. Ain't going to make us no difference. Symington drinks his drink and puts a 50 on the bar. I'm on my way to his room. I'm going to be tied to his hip for the next month. Really? Why are you going to do that? I write for Emancipation Magazine. I'm writing a profile on him for the election. Anything you want to say I can use? The bartender contemplates for a moment. He starts to speak, but catches himself. Have a pleasant evening, sir. Symington leaves the bar area. He walks into the lobby and enters an elevator. Interior, the St. Charles Hotel, luxury suite. Symington exits the elevator and heads down a long corridor, populated with reporters, photographers, etc. He walks to the door of Senator Powell's suite, where security checks his credentials and ushers him in. Senator Powell's suite is enormous and opulent. Powell's just-completed speech plays low on a television, as a number of delegates and power players wearing Powell for President buttons watch along intently. Powell, drink in hand, is seated comfortably on a long sofa with confidants in front of the television. He watches intensely with a wide grin. An aide escorts Symington to a chair across from the senator. Who do we have here? Hello, Senator. Symington Smith, Emancipation Magazine. He extends his hand. Yes, I knew your father well. I heard you were at Emancipation, so you'll be doing the profile on me. Good. Powell turns his attention back to himself on the television. Welcome aboard the Powell Express, son. Rest yourself a spell. This is almost over. Somebody get Mr. Smith a drink? A waiter comes over. Scotch and soda. On the screen, the senator waves at the exuberant crowd. I love this country. And you know what? This country loves me. 